these markets are pretty well washed out and we're looking forward to uh, much better times over the next so uh, not only next year which i think will be a good year but not a great year but over the next three to five years i think it's going to be substantially higher than probably 2011 believe it or not this episode of MiningStockEducation.com is brought to you by Sandstorm Gold Royalties. Sandstorm Gold Royalties is a different kind of gold company. They purchase royalties on select mining operations and receive a percentage of the revenue in return. Sandstorm now has a portfolio of nearly 190 gold royalties around the world. See how gold royalties differ from other gold mining investments at SandstormGold.com. That's SandstormGold.com. Sandstorm Gold Royalties trades on the TSX as SSL and on the NY. SE American as S A N D. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for tuning in to another Mining Stock Education episode. I'm Bill Powers, your host, and today I'm joined with David Morgan, who's the founder of the Morgan Report and the author of the Silver Manifesto. Now, if you're at all interested in the precious metals uh, arena and this sector, you already know David very well. But David, it's your first time on this podcast, so thank you for joining me. Well, it's great to be with you, Bill. Thanks for asking. Well, you are the silver guru, so the first question has to be, where is silver headed? And I'm going to have a follow-up question to that being, is $10 an ounce silver possible in 2019? Well, silver's headed higher, but that doesn't mean it's not going lower first. Is it possible to hit $10 in 2019? The answer is, is it possible? Yes. Is it likely? No. Is it probable? No. I really, really doubt it. I mean, the problem with silver is that it can uh, baffle the best of us. And it just is that kind of a metal. I mean, if you look back in the 2011 run-up, you look for a year, I mean, that silver basically held a really strong base around $30. And I was thinking perhaps it could hold it. And it didn't. And it tested the $26 level like three times. And on the fourth time through, I gave out a warning to all our paid people, get ready. You better hedge. We're going through 26. Look out. And basically from that point till now, it's been down, sideways, down, sideways, down. It hit the bottom at the end of 2015. We're still higher than that, so I think the low's in. But we did see under $14 an ounce silver about a month, month ago, which kind of surprised me. Would you say that the primary driver uh, of the silver price right now is institutional demand rather than investor demand? Yeah, I think uh, institutional demand or what I'll call industrial demand doesn't really vary that much. It does somewhat, but it's investment demand that makes the big price swing, so exactly correct. Do you think that uh, a commodity like silver, which is also money, as you often point out, could it stay below the average all-in sustaining cost for extended period of time in a way that we see uranium doing, where uranium might be trading at $28 a pound, but on average it costs about $60 a pound all-in sustaining costs. Could we see something like that happen in silver? I know you're bullish, but is that possible? Absolutely. The reason being is that the uh, primary silver miners only produce about 25% of the market share, which means 70%, roughly 75, comes from uh, base metal producers, lead, zinc, copper, and gold. And as long as those miners, lead, zinc, copper, and gold, are mining their product at a profit, Silver is only uh, an add-on to them, and they don't really care what the cost is as long as their primary market is favorable. So you would see a decrease in supply, but you could also see a price that is not uh, liked by silver bulls. So the primary driver then of the coming bull market would be, do you think we have to see an, a monetary collapse or some something dramatic happen within the financial system to see a dramatic rise in silver? I know you've often talked also about the speculation of silver being used in the electrical vehicle revolution. As you look at the future rising silver price, is it primarily though some financial catastrophe ahead that would cause you to see the rising silver price? Well, Bill, that's an excellent question. I'm going to answer it in kind of two parts. One, yes. Primarily, especially go back, you know, from my, when I started on the internet 20 something years ago, I mean, it's going to take some type of financial conundrum, some kind of quote unquote crisis, scare, reset, you put whatever word you want. I'm not trying to cause anyone any fear at all. These things have happened again and again through monetary history, but it's going to take that quote unquote crisis to move it substantially higher. Having said that, there have been some interviews where I've pointed out that it could have a uh, double factor, meaning that during a financial panic, run to gold, silver tags along, or whatever's moving it from an investment perspective, 
also tightens up the industrial side supply enough where they become speculators out of necessity, which means that you've got to run the gold, spills over into silver, silver physicals coming off the market like crazy, like it did in 2011. All of a sudden, Apple Computer, Mitsubishi, some Samsung, LT, um, all decide that their warehouses aren't holding very much silver whatsoever at all. Now they're competing with investors to warehouse some because they don't have it. They're out of business. When you approach silver investments, because you not only invest in the precious metals, the physical precious metals, but you also focus on resource stocks. How are you approaching silver resource stock investments right now? Basically, we've you know kind of flattened out what we put in the silver market. And we've gone in as kind of the resource de jour, you know, lithium, Molly, a long time ago. Molly's actually up this year, one of the few uh, metals that's up. Uh, cobalt, we have a great, you know, if you want to ha- own, be an owner, one of the best cobalt plays available, you know, we've reported on it. Uh, we were first on zinc. Our zinc uh, company had great silver credits. That stock doubled. We sold it at a double. It's since then fallen off substantially. We're not afraid to take a profit. We're not afraid to rotate. We're not afraid to look at, you know, what's the best going on in the resource sector currently. Uh, Our uranium pick kind of made a round trip. It uh, fell off like a lot of the uranium stocks, but it actually started to move up rather well. So if you got in during that time frame, it's done quite well. And it's also got a great uh, vanadium resource that comes along with that project. So we're pretty happy about that. So obviously, as you said, not just silver. And we just look for what's, you know, the best play. But overall, consistency does pay off, meaning that since we favor the royalty and streaming companies so much, and these companies are basically financing houses with extremely low overhead, which means high profit margins, they still do well, even in kind of the worst of times. So some of those top tier cash rich unhedged streaming slash mining slash royalty companies still are doing pretty well for our investors. Yeah, I was flipping through um, the Silver Manifesto this morning in preparation for our interview, and I read the chapter that you wrote on uh, royalty and streaming streaming companies, and it was pretty convincing that you really like this model, and it made a lot of sense, and I believe you even said to look at them as a bank, essentially. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, a bank that's built with uh, metals backing it. Yeah, no, it's, it's, you know, I mean, a lot of people don't know what we do or understand it or sophisticated enough or care or whatever, but, you know, we care. You know, we care about you. We care about your, you know, your profitability and how well you do in these markets. And, you know, it's been been rather dire straits for many this last five, six years, and we're included in that group. But if you look at that group as a whole, we're still, you know, surviving. Many have left, many have moved into pot and that type of thing. Whereas, you know, I've always written kind of an institutional quality letter for the retail market. We have hedge fund managers that, you know, follow us and that type of thing. But <clears throat> nonetheless, uh, you know, no, no regrets on what we're doing. Uh, and we also think that uh, now is the time. We think that, you know, these markets are pretty well washed out and we're looking forward to uh, much better times over the next, uh, not only next year, which I think will be a good year, but not a great year, but over the next three to five years, I think it's going to be substantially higher than probably 2011, believe it or not. Within the next few years is your expectation. Yes. It is. Wow. A couple more questions on royalty companies. Do you look at the ones, there's been a lot of royalty companies and also like a hybrid, I would refer to company between a prospect generator and a royalty company. Are you looking at any of those sub 500 million market cap or even sub 100 million market cap royalty companies? Somewhat, as you may or may not know, and you probably don't know, Bill, I started one. I started Lemaria Royalties, and uh, we're looking at that sweet spot where, you know, Franco Nevada or Royal Gold, uh, Wheat and Precious Metals wouldn't want anything to do with such and such a company because it was so small, it wouldn't really fit their portfolio, but it would for a niche market like ours. So we actually went in and started that company, or I started it with a, a, a very solid team. We found a good streamer that we got and put into the portfolio a lot of cash. Since that time, it's been merged, and uh, the cash that was in that merger has been moved into a gold-backed bond at about 11%, which is a pretty good price. you got all the upside to the gold price, and it's backed by gold, and you're earning 11%. So our investors are happy. they rather see a public event where you get the multiples that you get in a gold company, and that hasn't happened yet. But in this market, you know, we've done fairly well. And adding one thing onto that, I'm not trying to 
you know, degrade anyone. But what I will say is we were um, one of, of a few that had the same idea that there's a niche market in the royalty streaming space and for micro cap type of situations, you know, companies a million dollars, $2 million, $5 million, that kind of thing. And several of them made deals that were absolutely something I would walk away from because they didn't generate a real rate of return for their investors. We looked, as me as the head, at a minimum of 15% IRR uh, internal rate of return. Mm -hmm. And unless that was going to be uh, the minimum, I would not do the deal. So some of these deals are made just to do deals, in my view. Uh, but nonetheless, that's 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 so probably over answered the question. But thanks for asking. No, I was speaking to a mining engineer actually just uh, what was it four days ago, and he told me I asked him specifically about what deals are out there in streaming and royalty right now, and he said there are not many fifteen uh, percent IRR opportunities out there right now. Yeah, that's right. I mean, we did one, and uh, and I asked, it turned out better than that, <clears throat> but. Uh, we're just basically in a hold mode right now. And the new company has a little different model than a streaming or a royalty. I don't have time to go into it, but it's basically a refinery. So there's some credits given on the refinery side where you could buy gold or silver or whatever. You're going to refine at a discount, and I'll just leave it at that. If you're interested, you can send me an email. Just go to our website and just go to support at themorganreport.com, and uh, my staff will forward it on to me. David, a couple more questions about investing in silver miners right now. Um, late stage developmental plays uh, that have a big silver de deposit, are they at all of interest to you as potential optionality plays since you see a rising silver price? Absolutely, but I have to look at it real time, more or less. I'd have to do some technical work and see if it's, and fundamental work, see if it's overvalued, undervalued, or fair valued, and how much upside it has. I'll do a sensitivity analysis like it's outlined in the book. And we'll take a look, and if it looks like it's fair or undervalued and not doing, many people know about it, sure, I'd take a shot at it. I would put it on the Morgan Report more or less as a trade rather than a long-term holding, depending on the dynamics I just outlined. In silver jurisdictions, uh, Mexico is potentially changing some upcoming laws. W what are you liking in terms of silver jurisdictions, and what cautionary advice might you give listeners? Well, we've already cautioned our members about the Mexican situation, and I'm not overly overreactive to it. I said early on, I think we should hedge a bit. We did, and uh, the hedge worked out because the silver price dropped so much, nothing to do with the, the election, really. But I do think there's some concern now more about the election. I think it's going to be a tax increase. I think it's something that's not going to be a huge big deal. Yeah, it will knock off some of this uh, Mexican silver miners for a while. But, you know, if silver is going from the current price in the 14s up into, you know, 25s to 30s to beyond, um, that's going to be a small, you know, situation in the bigger scheme of things. So, you know, we're taking it in stride, watching it closely. Usually governments do what's simple and easy. It's easy to increase a tax rate. It's hard to confiscate, nationalize a mine, that type of thing. I mean, I know those noises are out there. I know that there's, you know, people kind of pushing that meme. But I don't buy into that whatsoever at all. I think it's more likely it is to a tax increase. Do you think a, a, mine, a silver mine like the Escobar mine in Guatemala uh, Tahoe's, um, of course, Tahoe's being acquired now, but that, that mine, do you think, what's your, you have any opinion or expectation with that mine? A little bit. I mean, we did a write up at the Morgan report and I don't have it in front of me, so I don't want to misstate it for people that pay me, but, uh, we went through it. I mean, sometimes, you know, if you, if you really dig deep, um, a lot has to do with goodwill when you move into the country. I mean, if you do it right, and most Canadian miners do, but not all, uh, and you build a great rapport with the people that you're mining in their, you know, in their jurisdiction, uh, and you build it right. In other words, build it right with the people and the community and what are they going to give besides jobs and that type of thing. Then you have a lot less political backfall or backlash on that side of the thing. And, you know, I don't want to go too deep, but yeah, we addressed it. We think that Pan American is going to make it work. Uh, Ross is a uh, legend in his in his own time, as he should be, he certainly addressed all kinds of problems throughout the mining industry, throughout um, the globe, really. Or And you know, Russia's one. I mean, I don't want to belabor it, but I mean, even Ross made a mistake in Russia, but he admitted it and moved on and, you know, cut his losses and just moved forward. So 
uh, hopefully I answered that question. I don't, mm -hmm. but I, you know, I do want to make a, a stress the point that, um, there's a lot to be said about the spade work, and I don't mean that so much as me. I mean that as a metaphor, you know, going in and really getting to know the location, the people, what they want, what they need, what's the most important to them, and that type of thing, and the politicians as well, obviously. And if you can get that accomplished and kind of set it up where everyone pretty much knows what's going on in the future, why, who's getting, you know, how many of the townspeople will be hired, and on and on. If you go in there with a bit of a different attitude or perceive that you're the big, you know, nasty mining company and you're done, da, 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 you know, you can't have problems. Now, just because you set the table correctly doesn't necessarily mean that everything's going to go smooth, but it certainly pays big dividends if you at least start in that way. Rick Rule says that uh, small mines have all the same potential problems as big mines, yet they don't possess the potential cash flow upside that the big mines have. With that being said, do you ever invest in smaller producing junior uh, silver companies? Generally, no. I mean, we have a rule, pretty much rule of thumb. We want 20 million ounces of silver, not silver equivalent as a minimum before we even talk to anybody. Have I broken that rule? Yes, I have. In fact, we did a write-up on a company that we discussed off air that we don't own anymore. We did. We owned it through a drilling company because they had a big position in it, and you probably know who I'm talking about. But that's the exception, not the rule. But if we do make the exception, uh, we explain it fully. Again, we just rewrote it, uh, not owning any at this time, but that doesn't mean some of our earlier subscribers, because we have a lot of you know loyal people that have been with us you know, 10 years, 15 years. I mean, we have some people with us from the inception of the Morgan Report. Not many, but some. And uh, they might still own it. So we wanted to give them the, uh, you know, the latest, the greatest, and update on that company. Well, David, before you go, is there anything you'd like to make listeners aware of? Yeah, I'm breaking out into the energy space. I'll be writing a uh, higher end uh, report for income, cash flow, and large capital gains. If you're interested, you can go to the new website URL. It's called comingenergyboom.com. That's comingenergyboom.com, all one word. And your websites are also themorganreport.com and silver-investor.com. Is that right? That is correct. Thank you. David, thank you for joining me today. I appreciate it. For millennia, ancient pharaohs prospered from unparalleled riches made possible by Egypt's resource-rich gold deposits. But despite this rich history, modern Egypt remains one of the most underdeveloped gold mining countries in the world. But that's all about to change. Aton Resources is leading the charge on the Egyptian mining revival. As the only public exploration company in Egypt, Aton Resources has first mover advantage. Focused on their 100% owned Abu Marawat concession, Aton Resources is advancing several exploration targets, including the recent discovery of the legendary Lost Mountain of Gold at Rod Ruin. Learn more about this exciting drill program and other news at AtonResources.com. Aton trades on the TSXV under the ticker symbol AAN and on the OTC under the ticker ANLBF. Thank you for listening to this Mining Stock Education Podcast. Please subscribe and share with like-minded investors. Visit us on the web at miningstockeducation.com for more resources on precious metals and natural resource investing. At our website, you can also sign up for our free newsletter for interview transcripts, stock picks, and more.